What a fucking nightmare of a morning. Why? Honestly. Okay, so my washing machine's broke, yeah. It's not glamorous. My washing machine's broke. So I went to the... I was doing some work this morning and I went to sort my washing out at the laundrette. Left it for 30 minutes, got back, opened it up and flooded the whole fucking laundrette, man. Honestly. I flooded the fucker, didn't I? <laughs> so what do you mean you opened it? When it's mid, it mid floor. It hadn't drained. It hadn't drained. It's, 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 it's a dodgy washing machine or something. And it, it, it just flooded. And everyone in there was like, whoa. And I was like, oh, my God. Soaking wet. I had to carry all the shit back in the rain. I was like, this isn't good. <laughs> well, it's a good excuse for being late, to be fair. I'll give you that. Yeah, well, there you go. If you go right back to the beginning, Mez, like, I don't know, you know how many of your current fan base would know about the need. Do you think, like, gives an idea of... You know, you'd, how he got into a band right back in the day. Well, you'd be surprised, actually. Like, the current fan base still know about the need. I swear down, like, sometimes when we're playing, even, like, when we're in a... Even abroad and stuff, they're like, oh, I recognise you. It, in fact, last time we played, when we was in New York for New Colossus, someone came up to me and was like, I remember you from the need. And, like, often, often some of, like, Stu and stuff just, like, turn their back and they're like, oh, for God's sake, it's still following <laughs> us around. Um I mean, we didn't really have a massive impact, but I guess like we had three singles that did all right, and we were at, we were sort of like the back end of of uh, of that kind of indie scene, and went our set different ways. I get kind of like did our own thing, um, but we still get I still get commented on it, you know, which is nice because uh, I do look back at the, that that period with like real fond memories, and it was like. You know, ever since moving to Hull, really, was was the start of the neat and the start of, like, me and Loz and, and Bowden and Rich and stuff like that. Um, from the early bits where we were kind of just, like, chucked into the Hull scene and it was a bit grot rock and everyone was just playing sort of, like, punk music and trying to be a bit like the Paddingtons, I guess. And it was just fuel... It, you, I mean, you were there, man. It was, like, hedonistic. It was just, like, parties at 79, parties at... What flat number was you? What hey, 69, yeah. 69 and we had 79 on Grafton Street. Oh, uh, right. And um, it was just like, you know, it was just about, I, I don't really think we ever thought about music back then. It was just about being out and, you know, doing all of the kind of stuff that you did at that age, taking drugs and just having a good fun. And then like, I guess like two years of that and then we just sort of focused on the neat being its own kind of thing. And there is a comment on one of your recent songs there's like a meet me in the bathroom reference, like snip yeah. it up just to get through. Is that kind of how you look at, back on it a little bit? Yeah, well, that was like, yeah, that's in one of our our singles, Bum Hour, from uh, the last album, A Picture of Good Health. That was like, it's a reference to that time, to be honest, but it was also like a reference to the fact that I remember coming up to uni and like um, the Stroke's second album came out and obviously that's a reference, direct reference to that lyric as well as like, you know, everyone was in the bathroom and, you know, just sniffing up you know, what what we used to do at like 18, 19, you know? Uh, so it was nice to reflect on that and then put it into a, a song that was yeah, yeah. current. Um, but yeah, it was definitely, I always, I always look back at that and try and get in those little bits about old things and old times, just because like, you know, it's part of where we came from. So it's nice to reflect on it. But yeah, you were from Lincoln originally. Yeah, that's right. So it's funny because Loz was, Loz moved to Lincoln and that's how I met him at school. But he was obviously from Hull. And then we decided to come to Hull Uni together in 2005. Uh, and that's when we sort of like, I met everyone else and I met yourself and I met like, you know, everyone from that scene, you know. Um, and that's where it all kind of started. And I ain't left Hull since then, you know. I'm pretty proud of, you know, although I'm, you know, I'd say that I've, it's definitely, I feel like I've been adopted by the city because, you know, I've been here a good 15 years. Um, and I've never really ever wanted to, to leave. I really, I've always enjoyed what Hull has given me. So it's like, it's been a big part of my music journey, really. Yeah, I was going to ask you about that. Like, you obviously seem to have a good relationship with Hull and you always, you always like mention Hull when you can, whether yeah. it's like at gigs or on your albums or whatever. So yeah, you've obviously got a good relationship with the place. Yeah, I mean, I just think for me, it's like, I can remember coming to Hull and and then and I think I guess being in the neat taught me a lot about trying to be in a band that was professional 
and getting it to that level. And I guess, you know, for anything, the neat was my blueprint to, to life, to them making life as successful as we have been, relatively successful as we have been. Um, so, and I always reference all, cause you know, I've done a lot of community work here. I've, I've left the, I left the Warren a year ago, but it was a big part of my uh, background and, and being a youth worker and stuff. And it, um, you know, especially putting on like the industry conferences with 53 degrees North with Stu as well, who's obviously in, in life. Um, I've always wanted Hull to get better and, and and not just be a dead end. You know, there's only one way in from the South and that's the Humber Bridge. I've always wanted it. I've always wanted people to not look in inwards and look outwards because, you know, there's a lot of talent here, whether you're a musician or an, an artist or a writer or anything. And it's just, it's just good to see um, that community spirit sort of like filter into other aspects of the country. So I've always been proud of Hull and, I, I guess that, but then I think everyone from Hull is proud of Hull. And then even if you move to Hull, you become like, like I say, adopted and you always speak about it and everyone always has great things to say. But if, if but if you always come across someone like, oh, what, you're from Hull? I bet that's a bit shit. And you, you've always got to sort of like correct that or be like, no, it's not shit. It's actually, it's actually really good. You mentioned, you know, people back in the day trying to sound like the Paddingtons and stuff, but you're obviously quite different in terms of, I don't know, your influences and stuff compared to other Hull bands. Would you say that's a fair assessment? Yeah, definitely. I think like when we moved to Hull, I think um, or when I moved to Hull and obviously met everyone else who, who then joined the Neat, it was like, it was such an exciting time because I've obviously had like the Libertines and that had obviously had a knock-on effect with, with the pads and the pads were obviously from Hull and, and doing real well at that point. So I guess there was a lot of bands trying to um, not emulate them, but like, you know, you, you're always going to be influenced by a success, another successful band within your city, especially one so small as Hull. Um, and I guess we we played around with that kind of like, you know, that indie rock kind of sound at, 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 in our initial forms. But then, you know, we, we decided to go our own our own way. And we did, I can remember, our, you know, there was a big turning moment for, for the Neat when we was sort of like looking towards London and going to London most most weeks to play. Uh, I can remember one one gig at Madame Jojo's, which I don't think is there anymore, but it's in Soho. Um, and that's when I met like Steve Lamarck. And it's when we were sort of like, you know, kind of sounded more uh, rather than that kind of indie sound from that from that time. We were a bit more sort of spiky and art rock. Um, and we kind of fell in with a lot of bands from that London scene and uh, like these new pure and selectors at Yana Holmes, uh, Wild Palms, Chasms. Uh, old children I think and sort of like and that kind of influenced us a lot then and that's when we sort of went away and recorded singles like In Your First Pleasure and Hips and I really sort of uh, decided to do our own thing which I, which was great because it meant that you know we were started to get our own accolades and I mean Six Music and Steve Lamack have championed have championed uh, you know my, well my music from 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 those singles all the way to obviously being in life um, so it was definitely a way of us breaking away from what was happening in Hull and, and becoming our own band in our own right. And I mean, one question we asked bands is if they felt part of a community of bands back in the day, but is that what you're saying? You kind of... Yeah, there was definitely a community within in Hull and stuff. And then like, in order for us, you know, there was already the Paddington's who were successful from, from Hull and we couldn't just be another Paddington. So like, we had to then, I can remember sitting with like Laws and stuff and, you know, being like, well... You know, we li- we listen to the fall. We listen to like Joy Division and stuff, but, and, and a lot of like and the Buzzcocks and more of the art rock kind of sound. And that was happening in London. And we were going to like, well, it was Shoreditch that was hip then, and then moving into Dalston, I guess. But like, we were going there every week, and we were playing with bands that were more similar to us. And that I guess that shaped us and got us on our and got us on the ladder in terms of you know being played on radio and stuff. And that and and we became our own sort of like identity then, and then it kind of blossomed from there. And as I say, like I learned a lot from that period. Um, I mean, the neat only really released three singles. We never did an album. We did like in you for pleasure, the hips and new kids all were like playlisted on sticks music, which was unheard of at that time. Um, and then um, it really sort of like taught me a lot, which I then brought into, you know, when, when members left the neat and I decided to start again with life, it really like um, made me a lot more focused on, having the full package and getting and getting ready to sort of like go on to do what I have done in for, for a good six, seven years in life now. Um, you know, I've been all over the world and stuff, so it's not too bad. <laughs> yeah. yeah, Not, not too uh, shabby. <laughs> <laughs> when the neat 
started to put out things like In Youth is Pleasure and Hips and stuff, we were actually being courted by labels. Um, Rough Trade was one of them. And I remember meeting the guy, he actually signed uh, Warpaint, who we played with a few times. Um, and But he was just, he was quite honest. He was like, you, at the moment, you're wearing your influencers too much on your sleeve. Um, I think he, that was a reference to probably sounding a bit like The Fall. Uh, and... Um, so we just continued doing what we did. Uh, and I took that into life as well. Like, you know, we got pop music out on our own label and distributed it ourselves. And it just happened to do real well. It was like Radio One's album of the year. Well, in the list of Radio One's albums of the year. And then like with a picture of Good Health, this life second album, you know, we had, we released four singles and they were all playlisted. And then it was like six music album of the year. So we were beginning to like get quite a lot of accolades, which obviously helps because, you know, people... You know, it's a fickle world, but people like bands that seem to be received well from from critics, which is what we've managed to do with the two albums that Life have released. So we were fortunate with that, and you know, it was testament to us to like us writing and continuing. Um, but we never, I've never really set out to get a deal. I don't think I've just when it happens, it happens. I can remember like the neat. We we were being courted by a few labels, but we never got picked up fully. So it was like most bands then our heads are down and we didn't really want to think like that. So it was like, just keep on going. And if you have creative control over everything, you actually end up in a better position. So like life are in a better position now because we own all of our recordings and, and, and things like that. And we have a lot of say on what we do uh, because of that. And it's also made us a lot more focused on how to navigate the, I guess if we're calling it in, in terms like how to navigate the industry, because we already have those connections as a band, we have we have professional connections because we've had to manage the band ourselves. So it's been a good thing because we're in control of our own sort of like trajectory. It felt like you're doing everything right back in there. Like you had, like I said, enemy attention, uh, Radio 6 attention, yeah. playing Reading and Leeds. But like you say, you didn't actually release an album as the neat. Like I think by the time we had the album ready, we were already ready to start again and start a new project and really focus on that. Like I literally, I have a, there's a neat album unreleased that's in my drawer, like 10, 10 or 11 tracks. Um, so who knows that might come out one day, <laughs> but like, yes. um, yeah, I think just because we'd got to a point where the three, the three official singles within youth is pleasure and hips and new kids, they'd all done so well, but it, it, it got to a point where it was like, well, let's start again with life, with, with what became life and really focus on getting albums and, 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 and progressing even further. I think like I see the neat as like, almost like my apprenticeship in, as a band. So like I learned from that and those memories will always be, will always be close to me, but I've managed to put them into life and become, uh, and make sure that life has become, you know, a viable uh, outlet for, for all four of us. Yeah, so you just like use that experience to to benefit life, basically. Yeah, essentially, like use that experience to then put into something else. And when you come out, you know, like life came out of the blocks, and it was like, oh, it's a new band. You get that new band buzz, and then you build on that, and you build on that, and you build on that, and you get. Um, and it's like you know, there was always those like you know, Steve Lamack will always say, um, he'll always reference like the neat and stuff with life. So it's never, it's not that we never got an album out. I guess it's part of the the journey, but. Um, I think it just felt right to start start fresh and and we were constantly like like you've already touched on we were constantly evolving and constantly our songs were constantly changing so like there was never one consistency with with maybe the neat other than like the the three singles they were similar sound but with life it's always it's been you can tell there's a definite sound and a definite journey from album to album and I guess that's what's made us more successful it's uh, never been uh, muddled I guess. And I actually mentioned you on a previous podcast because um, it's a bit of a weird reference, but we had a for like a bit of a bonus episode. I, I had a comedian on called Sean McLaughlin, and I was um, kind of comparing a comedian's style of like having a high turnover of material. And I kind of said that you you guys are like that. Like I always remember, like you've, you've had quite a high turnover of songs ever yeah. since you started. Really, like you got quite a bit of attention for your early songs, like White Boy and stuff. And yeah, yeah. maybe other bands would have you know kept them in the set list but you were quite prepared to get rid of them and move on kind of thing yeah because i think like we did those songs they were like we ripped them in like so fast and it was like of that time and then 
as we were coming to grips with like who we wanted to be, we were just kept rewriting and rewriting and fine and honing in on a sound. And so we weren't ever scared to drop those kind of like songs that obviously certain people loved them, but then obviously we changed it with like In Youth Is Pleasure and, and stuff like that. And that became like that. And then we took that into life and, and created the albums that we've done with life. And it's always like, I think we've never been scared of sort of like letting go of something if it means that we can keep progressing. Um, so yeah, we have had a, I mean, yeah, you are right. We have had a high turnover, um, which is crazy. I, I wouldn't want to see all the songs written down. <laughs> <laughs> you know? Do you think that's kind of like a case of progressing and getting better kind of thing? Like, like you say, you wrote those songs quickly when you were young. Cause it's yeah. just, you've always kept that style of, you know, just yeah, know, think, knowing the more you progress, the better the songs are going to become kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And never to be precious either. Like I, we just write and then when we're feeling something, then we'll just keep writing. I don't think you can always dwell on everything. So it's like if something's sounding, each time you're writing something and it's sounding better, then it just shows you that you're progressing. And we've always sort of tried to embrace that kind of um, that kind of thing, I guess. I mean, you can even cite it like popular music, the album, our life's first album is, you know, that was like a collage of material and it obviously did real well and there's some good songs on there. And then with a picture of good health, it like, it jumped even more for us. And, you know, we were all able to quit our, quit our jobs and, you know, go and, you know, go and be a professional band finally. Um, and, and that just shows, I think it's always about, it is on the strength of songwriting and, um, you know, we've just literally finished our third album. We recorded it in lockdown um, and we're excited for well, when we can all go back to it <laughs> uh, to get that out as well. And, you know, I think it's just about keeping busy and keeping creative. And I guess, you know, because most bands, I think, when I think about how long I've been doing it, like most people will have would have quit by now. And for some reason I haven't and uh, neither of the people around me really, even though we've had lineup changes, you know, um, we we keep going. Yeah, I was going to say you're the only the only original member left, aren't you? Really? I know, I'm the only original. I mean, Loz Loz was in life as well, and he he was obviously he wrote the first album with us, um, and then he left to you know go be a psychologist, which is what he's always wanted to do, and that's an amazing thing. And um, he's 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 living in Leicester now, and oh really? Like, I didn't know that. Yeah, he's living in Leicester. He's been living in Leicester for a good two years probably now. Um, and he's doing real well. He's actually supposed to be up this weekend, so I might go for a pint with him, but I, I don't get to see him much because, like, when last year we were, like, away constantly and it's kind of like sometimes I even forget that he was even in the band. Not as, like, I forget him because, obviously, he's one of my best friends, but it's just, it's just, it feels like such long times, do you know? So you mentioned you're all, like, you're a professional band now and you've managed to quit your jobs. I didn't even know that. That's really good. How, um, how did you get to that stage then? Well, we we got, I mean, we recorded a picture of good health and um, we still put the album out ourselves, but we, we managed to strike a deal with PS to distribute it as well. So we did jump. So we were essentially backed by a label was when the second album came out. And so I quit work in September 2019, which is when, whenever the first, whenever picture of good health came out, uh, I quit literally on the month it came out um, just because we were so stacked with, uh, I was trying to balance being a youth worker and being away every every weekend at the festivals all across like Europe and and going to America and stuff and it was just tiring me out uh, and a lot of the other guys had quit before me um, but as I'm a single dad it was like I needed to make sure that I had the money to to look after my boy as well um, but yeah by the time the album came out we were so stacked with with work in terms of gigging and touring and it was you know the album was doing pretty well and we were finally making money as a as a as a band so we all got to leave our jobs and focus on the album and you know we wouldn't have been able to do what we had done if if we'd have still been in work because you know we we were like for chunks of the year three months in like europe and then across to america and then back for all the festivals and then away again in december for our own uk run we wouldn't have been able to do it. So it was just, you know, it, it, it came, it was timely that, you know, a label put some investment in us and, and, and we were able to, again, springboard from the first album onto the second album and, and, and continue what we were doing. You know, it's a bit, it's funny. Cause like I was looking at the calendar, I, I shouldn't be looking at the calendar, but I was looking at the calendar and we was, we'd have just got back from a three week tour 
in America last week. We were supposed to be um, supporting idols in America to like 2,000 a night out there, which would have been amazing for us as well. Um, but obviously everything's dissolved since since March. Everything has been put on hold in, until it's all safe to do so again. And, you know, but we are still... Uh, we're still we're still doing all right. We're hanging in, but it's been very tight. It's been a bit touch and go with the old finances. <laughs> yeah, obviously, you don't have to tell me any details. But in terms of the investment from the record label, is that kind of similar to an old school advance that you'd get for an album or something? Um, well, it was kind of like a distribution deal. So they they did so we did get an advance. Um, it's not the same as what bands were getting. Uh, even back in the day, what you know, when we talk about the patterns and stuff like that, it, and it, but the thing is, those kind of advances don't really exist anymore. But it was enough for us to be able to get the record out, put our own stamp on it, still do it DIY, but it, it just meant that we had world distribution. So it, it just meant that you know, wherever we went, there was always a, a rep from the label to come and look after us and and and, and link us up with the press. So press, I mean, it, it helped a lot with like getting in front of people. And it helped a lot with finance as being, you know, on the road uh, and, and being away from home and but still being able to look after our bills kind of thing. The lineup changes you mentioned with um, yeah. Mick coming in. Do you write songs together, you and Mick? Yeah, I think it, I mean, if anything, I think it made us uh, more focused on creating. Mick came from... Mick moved to Hull after he'd been at Manchester Uni and the Neat was going through a bit of a rough patch. And so we, as, as soon as he joined, I think it was like, it almost felt fresh again and me and Mick were writing together. So uh, with obviously Rich and Loz who were in the Neat uh, and um, it just sort of like changed everything. So it felt right to do that. And then, you know, we just, we got onto a good run of releasing uh, singles from the first album, like Rare Boots and stuff like that. And really sort of like, we were back out playing all of those festivals again and, and touring. Um, so it felt right. And then that all led to like a picture of good health, the second album. And, and, you know, and that just sort of like, it really like blew up then once we put that album out, you know, it's not, it's been nonstop other than, and it would have been nonstop if it hadn't have been for COVID as well. So, yeah. And just in terms of him being your brother, like we've had the Cribs on who kind of touched on the facts, you know, their longevity is a lot of that's down to the fact that, you know, they've got, that trust and uh, they're always rooting for each other is obviously something that you've got with Mick as yeah. a brother in the band. Yeah, definitely. I mean, like it sounds weird to say, but like we could be writing a song and I'll like have the lyrics and then they're not finished, but he'll be able to finish them off as if I wrote it. And likewise, um, cause I guess obviously we've grown up together and like, you know, it's not just, he's not just a band member. He's my best friend and he's my brother. So it's like, um, we're always together. So it's like, it's made us very strong as a unit, I think, you know, which is, and, and which is the exact case in like, you know, the crib. And that's why it's done an amazing band because they've had that sort of like that route, you know, it can go two ways, I guess, if you look at Oasis, but like, yeah. <laughs> um, I think for us, it was grounding and calm influence and, uh, and that kind of thing. So it's been, it's been good to, to, to have that journey with him. Yeah. And the fact is, pretty good guitarist helps, I guess, as well. <laughs> yeah, he's pretty good, isn't he? <laughs> he has actually, he's been sponsored by Fender as well, the little bastard. No so he gets, free, he gets free guitars. Considering we only have one guitar, he makes a lot of noise. <laughs> yeah, just like the style of your live performances, I've always thought there's quite um, a theatrical element to life on stage. Would you say that's yeah. a fair assessment? Yeah, I mean, from, definitely, you know, we borderline on too much theatrics sometimes just because it's like we like to have fun on stage. And I've always, like, you know, one of my idols is Jarvis Cocker and that kind of, like, approach to sort of performing on stage and, and, and being a bit a bit weird and a bit a bit left field has always been fun. And it's definitely, like part of our live show to sort of like, it's not just about music, but it's about entertaining the audience and, and giving them and giving a show uh, and doing like, you know, there wasn't many bands who were doing that. You either, you know, it was either punky kind of stuff or it was like, um, I don't really know what I'm saying there, but like, I don't know. We just felt like we had our own way of, 
being on stage, which, and we've always had that. And I guess I've tried, I look up to people like Jarvis Cocker and when I watch things of early pulp, it's like seeing him move around, um, you know, that kind of thing. We've always tried to, you know, take a bit of that and, and, and give it back. And we've had people on who said like, you know, like becoming a character almost on stage makes it a bit easier to perform. Is that something you can relate to? Yeah, 100%. It's like, it's almost like a switch. Like in my normal life, I'm quite like reserved and shy, really. Um, but on stage, it's a different persona. And I think that helps with like being able to switch off from that as well. Because I think sometimes you can then, if you live how you live on stage, it can sometimes affect your own personal life as well. So I guess like I learned that quite quickly to sort of like almost be like, it's just another, it's an exaggerated part of me is on stage. Um, so I channel all of that when I'm on stage so that when I come off stage, I can be just myself again. So like when you're halfway through a tour and you're feeling a bit, you're like flagging a bit, you can just kind of switch, like switch it on kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. It's weird, but it's, it's weird. It's like sometimes you can be so knackered and, but then as soon as you're on stage, it kind of just, I don't know if it's adrenaline and that switch is on again. It's like, you're doing it. And then literally when you come off, you've got that adrenaline again and, you know, you enjoy the night. Um, but it is like a switch, man. It's, it's really weird to even think about it because that's essentially what it is. <laughs> and I guess there's that thing of wanting to be a bit different and from being in a band myself, a very average band, but you become very aware of people switching off in the audience. I suppose yeah. from your style, I guess you're trying to make sure you stay in people's memories, really. Stay in people's memories and keep folk and keep everyone like looking at the band. Um, like you say, the worst thing, the worst feeling ever is being on stage and then seeing half the losing half the room because they're not interested. Whereas it's quite hard to lose people's interest if you're giving it giving it your all. Do you know what I mean? And then yeah, just in terms of the subject of the lyrics, especially in life, it's very like social political commentary would you say that's a fair assessment and do you think that's something that brings the best out of you in terms of writing and musically yeah I think like it's definitely a fair assessment it's definitely social commentary from whatever situation I guess that I'm living through so like the first album was very much sort of a bit broader politics because I was still at the Warren and I was still doing a lot of youth work so it was about what I was seeing day to day in my in my job and sort of putting that into the music and, and talking about it quite openly. And then the second album uh, was a lot about me just being, it was more personal, what I call like personal politics. It was a bit more about mental health and, and being a single dad and, and living on my own um, and, and not being afraid to talk about things like that. You know, there's a song on the album called Half Pint Fatherhood, which is like, you know, I'm still 100% a father, but there's, there's only half of me in a relationship. Do you know what I mean? So it's like really wanted to sort of like, tackle those feelings of isolation and living on your own with a little boy um, and channeling it into music. So it's definitely like, I just write about what's going on around me. So whatever I'm feeling, then I'm going to write about it in a social commentary way and, and, and mix the same. So uh, it's, it's definitely a fair assessment of, 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 of our work lyrically. <laughs> we ask people you know, how they see it for new bands now in terms of making an impact and everything. But yeah, like you mentioned, you're quite DIY. Do you have to be quite well versed in that side of it to, to make a success of it, do you think? Yeah, I think like, and again, and this is a reference back to like, you know, the neat was the blueprint, the, the apprenticeship. It's like from whatever I learned there, I took into the band. So like, you know, we wrote our own press releases. We had our own I had like a spreadsheet with like who I needed to contact when we had singles coming out, pushing the radio because we couldn't afford any of that. So like we built these contacts and, and we made these like, you know, we became our own sort of PR team, our own management team. Um, you have to be real hands on and like, uh, and really establish. I mean, like it's, it's sometimes it's annoying to talk about like bands as like brands, but like you've really got to establish like your image and your brand and, and make sure that, everything you do so for example on social media sometimes it's beneficial that it's like i operate all of our social media because then it stays as one voice uh so it, there's always that one message uh and it's always developing and you've got to really like understand that those kind of things in order to really sort of in have a bigger impact if you haven't got that financial backing um 
so a lot of it's just taking ownership and not being afraid to experiment but really being focused on what you need to do and, and setting yourself to targets and, and goals and, and and going out and getting them sorted um because like otherwise no one's going to do it for you unless you are lucky enough to you know sign to a major label it's all about you know it's literally i mean we had a song on the on life's first album called in your hands but it literally is like you know it's about that it's about like taking control and of of your career i guess and you mentioned goals like i guess a major goal throughout your career has been being able to do it full time which you can do now yeah um, yeah but do you have any other kind of goals for what you want to achieve with life i'd love to be <clears throat> like we were lucky enough with a picture of good health to get a few um album nominations at like aim awards and stuff like that but i'd love for the next album to really sort of like you know um penetrate that side of things i think you know we do well on radio we're always well we're not always but like you know four four out of four of the last singles have been playlisted so like i'd like to see it expand into other things um we always set ourselves goals like last year i was my goal was for us to play glastonbury and we played glastonbury because it was like one of the only festivals we hadn't really done and we, we managed to go and play it um so it's from little things like that to the bigger things as well um but I guess as long as like the main thing is as long as we still stay relevant to to your audience and, and people still believe and want to listen to you, then that's the then you know that you're doing all right. And just going back to the community element, because I know you've had like good relationships with some pretty, you know, some of the bigger bands in recent yeah. times, like Slaves and Idols. Like how important has that been in terms of, you know, being able to make an impact? Yeah, I think like it's it's helped you know we've 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 played with both we've toured with both extensively um i think the main thing is because we just became good friends it was like we all had we all you know i was saying this the other day uh, and joe from idols actually came and visited us um last week he stayed with Stu, and we all went out for some drinks and stuff but like we just when we was on the on the circuit and they were doing so well but we had such common common ground in terms of our politics and our community work um that we really connected and we did the same with slaves and, uh, and, and again, you know, uh, good friends with Nadine Shah and stuff like that. So I think like there was a, it, I think what, what you saw recently is there's been again, a big community of bands looking after each other and saying, saying similar things and taking things into their own hands. You know, what's happened with idols is insane. You know, like the, the, the sheer that from, you know, touring with them, two years ago to touring with them last year, just the massive difference, like, and, and props to them there, you know, they're, they're probably the biggest band in, in the UK at the moment. So, you know, and that yeah. gives us, hope, that gives us hope as well. I'm not saying that we're going to be that big because we're probably a bit more niche. Um, but, um, you know, being friends with them is, is, is a, is, has, you know, uh, taught us a lot. And it's just about staying close to, to, to your mates really. I, mean, I don't know how much you've listened to the podcast, but it's definitely been a subject about you know modern guitar bands and maybe this I don't know like the guitar band scene isn't as good as it was back in the day. But I mean, how do you view it? Do you think it's just different or or what? I think I think like it's just as healthy, if not the quality is probably a bit better now. The problem is, I think, is there isn't the advances and there isn't the money that maybe we saw back back in the early two thousands. You know, bands were, if you sounded like the Libertines or had that kind of thing, you were getting big advance deals. You were still getting big, big, you know, there was still record labels looking to buy that. Whereas since 10, 15 years, we've had, you know, Spotify has gate crashed a lot of that. Um, so how we consume music is a lot differently, which means that labels can make money in cahoots with Spotify. Therefore, like artists aren't going to get deals like that anymore. So I guess, you know, it's, it, and it's also been like if trends as well, like um, which have been healthy. So the the rise of grime and stuff and urban music and uh, and that kind of thing has sort of had a, an effect on maybe the old school indie bands. You have to adapt and you have to you have to be different because um, music's always going to be changing. Um, but I think the music seems healthy, and that there are a lot of guitar bands doing doing the right thing and doing well. But I guess people aren't getting signed like they used to get signed. And, you know, but just like back when we're talking about, you know, in the early 2000s, people weren't getting signed like they were in like the 90s when it was Blur and Oasis. So it's like 
I think literally each decade, decade by decade, there's just less and less money for, for artists. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I was going to ask you about that. It's going back a bit, but do you think you... I mean, you mentioned that guy saying you were in your influences on your sleeve too much, but do you think you just slightly missed that era where a lot of bands were getting signed? Do you think if you guys were on a few years earlier, you might have been signed at that point? Yeah, I think so. I think because, like, the knee came out the tail end of that, and then we did, um, and because we were coming out the tail end of that, that's what kind of shaped our sound to be more more like some of the London the London scene bands uh, and what I used to call like the art rocker scene, which was like the magazine that everyone sort of like used to buy back then, which I guess has become now the replacement to like DIY magazine and stuff like that. Um, so I think like, yeah, we were the back end of it. So we didn't see the the label side of things. And so we had to just go and do our own thing uh, and and sort of like just grow as our own, as our own band. Cause I think, it was pointless just waiting to be signed. We just had to go and take it by the scruff of the neck and sort of get out there and, mm. and do what we wanted to do. Um, but yeah, you're definitely right, man. I think, and, and like I say, a dec- after each decade, the money and labels is just getting smaller and smaller because there's other ways people are consuming music, which means that unfortunately artists aren't getting what they deserve anymore. We've talked about that a bit, like we've had Alan McGee on that said, um, you know, the pay through from Spotify is pretty appalling. And then I'm sure you're aware of the campaign that um, the guy from Gomez was starting to try and get more money for artists through Spotify. Is that something you've kept your eye on kind of thing? Well, I mean, like, especially during COVID as well, I think, to be honest, I, like, I think Spotify have let a lot of people down because they're still making, they're still making tons of money and they've not helped any artists really. Whereas there's been some great, there's been some great um, music charities out there that have sort of like helped helped artists try and keep above water. But you know, I was saying this the other day. I was like, you know, we've had like a if you count all of our streams on Spotify, we've had like a, we've had a million streams in total. But like none of that has resulted in any in any f- sort of substantial money, which is just crazy when you know how 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 they operate like that it's really damaging they're making a lot of money out of artists but i guess you just become part of the algorithm and and you know there's nothing you can really do about it because it's just part of how we are consuming music at the moment maybe after covid there might be i think i'd like to see a lot more grassroots stuff i think people are getting quite annoyed um with big companies you know taking money when they don't need to Hopefully, I think I, I'm hopeful that like once this all dusts down and everyone's safe again, such what you know, there's going to be. I think it's going to be quite a different world for the music industry. Right. Okay. In terms of what? Sorry. Well, I just think like people have realised that there needs to be something. Something dramatically needs to change for artists to survive because we've all been struggling through this period. And I guess going forward. I think you'll find that there are a lot more people going to stand together and sort of kick back at certain things. I mean, I mean, I'm only like summarizing, but I'd like to see that. I think if anything, that this horrible pandemic um, sort of like shed light on is the fact that, you know, communities and especially independent businesses and stuff are, are joining, are joining up because it's our livelihoods and that sense of sort of in it together thing has really come across you can see the comparison with football at the minute they're having a similar debate where yeah definitely smaller clubs are really suffering say, yeah. and it needs a kind of you know more community approach to everything really yeah well it's the same it's the exact same isn't it like you can have artists making millions of millions and millions of pounds but you've got artists who are still you know it's still their careers who are making nothing and that's the same with football the gap is massive so it'd be good to sort of like have more of a community effect and a, a ripple through that to join everyone back together again because you need you need one to to, to for the other to thrive you know yeah i was just saying like obviously you've had to stick it out for the best part of 15 years to get to the point where you know you can do it full time do you think that's kind of the task that's facing young bands now is that They've really got to be committed to get anywhere kind of thing. Yeah, I think, like, 
when I go on panels and, and, and talk, especially with like uh, media students and music students and stuff like that, this is what I really try and hit home. It's like, there isn't, it's not really about overnight success anymore. Um, you know, we're a case in point, but again, like referencing idols, they were at it for again, 15 years until they hit big. And you can almost see that again, people don't really know, but pulp were the same and like, uh, and like elbow to an extent, you know, there is a lot, sometimes you have to do a lot of groundwork to get, to get to that, to, to get to where you really want to be. Um, and that's why a lot of bands sort of fizzle and fade because it, it does take a lot of, it takes a lot of commitment and it takes a lot from your life. Um, but yeah, it's definitely, it's definitely, a, it's definitely long term rather than, I don't think there is any like overnight successes as much these days. And then you mentioned you've obviously got quite a lot of creative control. So is that in terms of you can like decide what sing, what, what's going to be singles off the album and stuff like that? Yeah, definitely. I mean, <clears throat> we're always... We do have a management team. We decide on artwork. We decide on the singles. Um, we decide on, you know, pretty much everything that we put out is what 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 we want to do. Um, and I think a lot of bands are doing that now as well. So it's like, rather than being told, just believe in what you want to do and then go and do it. And then, you know, if you've got good management, then they should understand that and support that. And it only makes, it only makes the relationship better that way. Is it the same in terms of production and like, have you worked? I mean, we've talked a lot about different producers on on here. Like, but do you almost produce yourselves when you go in the studio? Or how does it work? Um, the, for life, we had we've we've worked with two different producers. The first one for popular music, we worked with a a chap called Ian Dowling, um, who had done um, uh, a few a few good bands. Uh, biggest sort of like breakthrough act was probably Waves, um, and then. For the second album, we worked with uh, Luke Smith, who's done, you know, he's done, he did the first few Falls albums. He's done all sorts, to be fair. Um, and then it was mixed by Cla- a guy, a chap called Claudius, who, who did all the Parquet Courts records. So we have worked with, we have worked with sort of like current producers who are, who are good, have good reputation, but, you know, they've often approached us to work with us. Um, so I think we've also been, well, they've definitely produced the album you know it's been very much a partnership when we're when we're recording yeah i know mick's a big fan of waves as well so that must have been pretty good yeah he likes that yeah he did <laughs> for a picture of good health the amp that he used was graham coxon's from blur <laughs> right yes yeah. and obviously he loved that as well but luke had, our producer had been working with graham coxon so like the amp the same amp was set up so we just kind of like went in and mick was in his element Yeah, I suppose they didn't mention chewing gum records back in the day. And the fact that Nick Hodgson from the Kaiser Chiefs picked you up for, the, for yeah, a few yeah. songs. Was it like a few songs or what type of deal yeah. was that? It was literally, he recorded and produced the the neat sort of like official singles, which was In Youth's Pleasure, Hips and, um, well, In Youth's Pleasure and Hips. And we put those, those two out on on vinyl. And, and that was really the springboard for us, really, because those those was sort of like epitomized our sound going forward as the neat and um we've actually got a few singles that we've we never released because it kind of just sort of like uh fizzled out but he was very much big influence on on me personally as well uh becoming sort of in control of the band i reckon you should definitely put that album on uh band camp by the way that that missing one i know man i, wish, I was thinking about it during during first few months of lockdown I was like, I was sat, I was look, I was going through a load of my, um, I've got this suitcase with a load of stuff in it and I just stumbled across a full, a full neat album of like, of that sound as well. So it was like In Youth Is Pleasure, Aging, loads of songs that like never even got released and just sat on it. Yeah, I think Black Wire did. Get them, uh, yeah, well, Black Wire did a similar thing and like, I know Tom quite well from the band and Dan Wilson and Dan Wilson actually has done some artwork for life. We've always had Mick does a lot of our artwork in terms of poster designs and, and single sleeves, and then Dan Wilson from Blackwire did the popular music sleeve, and then um, we actually wanted to use someone local for the second one. So Bobby Beasley, we we're a big fan of his photos that he takes. If you follow him on Instagram, he's a great photographer. So we just used the the soup bowl was him was him taking a picture of his dad holding some soup, and I 
thought it really reflected me being sort of like a lone parent kind of thing. Um, so we just went with that. But yeah, we definitely piece it together and and uh, it's, our, it's our decision. Cool. Yeah, because I remember all the ones you used to do back in the day, like the um, the neat posters and stuff. Yeah, yeah, because like Bowden, Bowden used to love that as well. I, I, it's lucky because like mixed the same same kind of like, just like Nick, he was very arty. So like we've been able to sort of create our own sleeves. And once you do that, then, you know, it's you've got full creative control then of, of artwork and the music. The reference to Noel Gallagher, but like he tried to, when we were playing a festival, we were camped by the main stage and um, which was a stupid decision. I don't know why we decided to, to do that, but I had Gus with me. Uh, it was about two years ago. It was only about one and um, Noel Gallagher was headlining and he tried to stop us getting back backstage. So I was like, I was a bit pissed off. So I was like, what do you want? Like, my boy not to sleep does Noel Gallagher want that responsibility and then he let us in kind of thing but they why they did come. he try to stop it well they, he had a whole he just parachuted in and his whole team like uh, basically circled the main stage and was stopping anyone getting in and out but like I had our tent and it was about 10 o'clock and I was like look I'm taking my boy to bed um, I'm, I'm not I'm not going to stay you know storm the stage like I'm, I'm, you know it, does he want does he want an unhappy boy on his hands <laughs> <laughs> Well, Noel Gallagher is like a sprout. It'll turn up every year, but no one really wants it. <laughs> <laughs> Woo!